Good evening, everyone. Um, so I'm Paul. I I'm actually based here in the International Digital Laboratory and hopefully in the next 20 minutes I'd like the opportunity to better tell you about some of the research that our group, Experiential Engineering, is involved with. And in particular I guess we're offering a user perspective. Um, we're in the engineering department and our interest is in the use of these tools hopefully to engineer better products. And I guess emphasising this point of engineering, um, I guess we're right at the hard end looking at engineers and designers and trying to help them. So we're coming from very much from an engineering perspective, I guess, rather than a marketing perspective. Now, engineers, I guess, our starting point is we know that the technology and the environments that we create are going to be used right by real people. I hesitate to say real people as opposed to engineers. But we need to appreciate that those people, when they react to these products and environments, are going to react in many varying ways. They can have subjective responses, they can have emotional responses. They may find things scary or exciting, confusing, relaxing, and they need to feel secure. And I think traditionally engineers and designers tend to rely on things that are objective and functional. It's much easier for them to come up with numbers than it is to maybe understand the, these varying um, aspects. So if we consider cars, it's much easier for an engineer to deal with predicting and um, creating performance or weight or uh, economy, whereas it's often, as you very well know, other aspects that will determine whether the car sells or not. So our group, even though we're, in, we're an engineering department, is bringing a multidisciplinary approach to this. And what our aim is, is to try and improve decision making during the development of a new product or a new environment by trying to actually predict and understand how people will subjectively react to that product and environment. And we recognise that the engineers themselves will very often have a different perspective to the users or the customers. And I use two words there, effective and efficient. And I, I think effective we would consider about trying to come up with a better product or environment. And efficient is the fact that we don't want to come up with a, an approach that's going to add a huge amount of cost to the process. We're trying to enable the engineers and designers to come to a confident decision as easily and cheaply as possible. And so within our team, we've got engineers, I guess myself, I've got a physics background, but as Gemma says, we've also recognised the importance of psychology. We've got two psychologists, a designer, an ergonomist, and somebody with a healthcare background. That's just within the team based in this building. All the work we do is with industrial partners, so we can also call on their expertise, and we work very closely with the automotive industry. We've got some other academic partners who are actually artists, but artists are very good at understanding the human perspective. We work with some local hospitals and the Strategic Health Authority, and many more besides. And then I'd like to really just move on and give you a few examples of some of the areas that we've been working on and are working on at the moment. So, you probably guess from the earlier picture we were interested in cars, and maybe let's look at one aspect that has a very strong subjective response. So, imagine now you were to take this car for a drive, and you put your foot to the floor to accelerate away. <coughs> I'm suspecting that the majority of you at that point wouldn't want the car to be silent. Maybe? Now, that's, a, that's, a, that's interesting because maybe you want it to sound exciting or refined or luxurious or sporty or fun or something that's emotional. And that's a real challenge for engineers because over the past 20 or 30 years, engineers have actually been making cars to be quieter. And quieter is quite a good target for an engineer. It's basically you start with a number and you make it lower. Whereas now, suddenly, make it more luxurious or sporty or fun. That's a big challenge. It's something that's positive as well, which I'll, I'll come back to that because we like to look at the positive aspects of products and environments. Similarly, as well as how you might perceive the brand, there's lots of useful information in the sound as well. At the top, we know that people who drive very quiet cars in the States, hybrids and electrics, sound provides information for pedestrians. Probably tells you when to change gear a lot of the time as well. And we certainly know it's very important in the perception of brand. Uh, Harley Davidson, the sound of the brand is hugely important. What we're really trying to do 
is to engineer sounds based upon people's subjective reactions. So how do we do that? Well, roughly we've got this graph showing you what we're trying to understand. Top left, we're trying to capture these drivers' perceptions in some sort of rigorous way. We then want to convert that into something objective, something that the engineers can deal with, which you may think is to do with the sounds, but actually that objective numbers to do with sounds aren't very useful. What we're really trying to get to are engineering targets, things that we can change, lengths, masses, stiffnesses, shapes, style. And then hopefully we'll end up with a car that will be more emotionally appealing to the driver. Similarly, if we change the car, what happens to the sound and how people are going to react. So that's what we deal with. And just to give you a hint of the sort of things that we've found, one of the challenges in the area is how people describe sound. Probably if a Formula One car was to drive unlikely as the things, but if it was to go through reception now, we'd hear it. Probably most of us would recognise it as being a Formula One car. But if I asked you to describe it, the language involved, major problem. So language with sound is a major issue in trying to get some sort of consistent, rigorous result. So we've looked deeply into how to capture rigorous language. In fact, we've looked at techniques used within marketing and in psychology. And one of the things that we've found is that if you imagine acceleration sound, about 80% of what you feel about the car from hearing that sound can be described by two dimensions. One, how powerful you think the car is, and one, how refined you think the car is. And you can find that you can plot different cars across this sort of powerful, refined space. And intriguingly, brands cluster together. So for instance, if our current vehicle was somewhere nondescript in the middle, we could say, well, let's try and make it as refined as Brand E and as powerful as Brand E. Sorry, it's refined as Brand B and as powerful as Brand E. So we're looking at how to set targets based on emotional response. Something else I'd like to add is that with sound, there's absolutely no substitute for listening to the sound. It's very hard to do anything in a traditional engineering way with numbers. So the sort of ways we need to understand how people react to the sound are not to do with the sort of horrific plots that you can get to try and present sounds in a visual way. And I think this is, it's also, in this particular case, there's an area of psychophysics called psychoacoustics, which looks to quantify how humans respond to sounds. And the psychoacousticians come up with lots of metrics, things like loudness and roughness and harshness, fluctuation strength, that try to to go further than the traditional decibel in understanding how people react to sounds. And they're very good for simple sounds, and they're very good for human response to sound, but they don't tell you the complex reaction we've got here, which is more of a customer to a product, which is much, much more involved. What we really need to know is how people react to the sounds themselves by playing sounds to them. And for instance, we have a listening room where we can play sounds both of current and simulated cars in a nice controlled environment. That can tell us a lot of information. But again, from our psychologist colleagues, we know that when you listen to a sound alone, that perception isn't the same as when you're driving a real car. Your concentration is made, hopefully, when you're driving a car on keeping the car on the road, not to listen, listening intently to the sound. So we look at things like more advanced simulation techniques where we've actually got a car simulator which can create the sound of any, any car in real time, and then we can put customers or engineers in that, and they can be driving along and switch, say, from a Jaguar to a Mercedes to a BMW to a Lexus, and directly compare the sounds. Or can be used by engineers to understand what happens if I change this engine mount or this suspension design. And then rather than relying on numbers, they're experiencing the sound, and therefore they're a lot more confident in the decisions they make. Real test is do people make the same decisions and have the same impressions in our simulators as they do on the road? So we need to understand how people appraise cars on the road, which gets us into the sort of techniques that Gemma's mentioned, that we need to understand things like facial expressions. We need to understand how people actually drive on the road as well when they're appraising it, and which bits of the drive cycle are most important to their impressions of the car. And then hopefully, eventually, by understanding at an engineering level and early in the development of a car, when it comes to the market data, we can get very high satisfaction. But what we do know is that between each of these levels, there are disconnects. And our research is trying to join up all these different approaches 
so that we can get the, the earliest correct decision in the development of a new car that will pre create the best output when it comes to the market response. Another example. Sounds may be in urban spaces, public spaces. These are some pictures of Coventry. But imagine if we went back to Coventry city centre now, maybe during the daytime, and it was silent. Again, maybe that wouldn't feel right. Maybe it would feel a bit spooky, a little bit uncomfortable. And yet if you look at the planning process and the people involved in design and architecture, they tend to treat it as noise. And it's always about reducing it. So we've been trying to focus on what are the positive aspects and trying to maybe highlight those. I think we saw a picture of a water feature. That's actually quite loud, but it's quite good at having a tranquil feeling when you're, sit when you're sitting next to it. It's also quite good at masking out irritating sounds. Traffic noise can be annoying, but the sound from individual vehicles is positive because it's giving you a warning that something's approaching. So we're looking at ways of trying to emphasize the positive. And I think there's an interesting point around soundscapes um, to do with stakeholders uh, and, the air and public spaces. If you consider a car, it's very easy to know what we're trying to achieve. We want to sell more cars. If you've got a public space, it's a lot less easy. And therefore, if you look at the people who are interested, at the one end, there's the traditional noise control engineers who go around with their sound meters and they're interested in controlling things like ASBOs and making sure that you satisfy with legislation. They want something nice, simple and easy and it's all about minimizing disturbance and they want to be able to measure things easily. At the other end, there are actually people who are we would call serious listeners. There are sonic artists, people who actually create soundscapes. There are people who like to conserve historically significant soundscapes. People at the British Library actually do this. And there are actually people who research soundscapes for soundscapes sake. So they're really seriously, really into the soundscape. But what we would say, and it's a little bit controversial in this area, is we don't think most people are actually bothered about the soundscape. We think there's this great set of people who actually live there and use it. And we think that when you're in a public space, what you're most interested in is actually using the space. And it's the activity that you're, you're doing in that space. And we think that's what's critical. And that can very strongly influence your perception. So for instance, if you're reading a book, your perception of a soundscape is very different, say, if you're visiting as a tourist. Because something that could be disturbing and annoying if you're reading a book or having a conversation could suddenly be really interesting if you're visiting as a tourist or if you're shopping. So it very much depends on your activity. And people are more or less willingly engaged with the soundscape itself. But we think it's interesting to look at the perspective of the users, which really in the research and work to date has been neglected. And we're trying to develop tools to understand how the users respond to the space, which is indirectly affected by changing the soundscape. People will feel differently about the place, even if they don't know it's the soundscape that has changed. And what we're really, again, we're engineers, we're interested in assessing how an intervention can affect the soundscape. So the sort of things you might consider at the bottom, um, traffic calming or road layout can affect the sound, say, in the town square. You can put in uh, acoustic barriers or natural features, water features, positioning benches in parks, things that you can do that will affect how a sound is experienced. And we're interested to try and help the planners, the engineers, the architects understand how the emotional response would be different for plan A versus plan B, based on how people would feel about the place as a whole. And just as a little analogy with our car work, what we've discovered with public spaces is rather than having powerfulness and refinement, there are two dimensions to do with how you feel the, about the place based on the sound. One is how calming you feel the place is, and the other one is how vibrant it is. And I think there's some interesting things here that you can plot different soundscapes across this space. And if you just measure the normal level in decibels or dBA as they do, there's no correlation whatsoever between the level and the level of calmness and vibrancy. So we know that this gives you a much richer picture of how people would feel about the place. But it can be used, for instance, um, to assess 
differences in engineering. So, for instance, especially in North America, more so in the UK, air conditioning units and how they're becoming more prevalent in our town centres. And people tend to assess them based just on the level of noise. We're suggesting it's much more important to look at the character. You can have different air conditioning units with the same level, but with different frequency content, and people will react to them very differently. And we can start to measure how they would react based on an approach like this. Another thing we look at is to do with how people, how people drive and their behavior and how that might affect economy, which is especially important as we move towards hybrid vehicles. Probably if you drive yourself, you may keep a record of your fuel economy. Probably, in most cases, it might not correspond to the published data for your own car, probably because of the way you drive and the types of your own style and the types of journeys you make. We know that driver behavior can have a big effect on fuel economy. And so we're looking at ways of trying to understand driver behavior in ways to, that we could then positively influence it. We also know that fleet models provide only highly average data and don't include things like hybrid and electric vehicles. So we're interested in the interventions. And so here we've got a case where how people are varying use of a product is actually affecting their performance directly. So we need to understand how the varying ways that people will behave with the product because our, the key feature of something like a hybrid vehicle is the economy and we know that how people use it will affect the performance. So we need to understand that better. We're also doing work with healthcare. Um, I guess in healthcare environments, it's clear that the, the most important aspects are to do with things like waiting times and the, sort of, and the clinical treatment that you receive. But there's a related area looking at the sort of more subjective aspect of the treatment and especially around the environments. And we're looking at applying some of the techniques that are developed with the automotive industry to improve healthcare environments and looking at not just how patients respond but how clinicians respond as well. And the key thing we're trying to achieve here is how to get participation and how to get the involvement of the users, the patients and the clinician, within the design and engineering process. And this is work that's just taking off with a major project that's just launched this year. Uh, though we've been working in limited aspects with this for a while now. So for instance, we've got a project looking at the effect of the environment in residential care homes on the level of depression on residents with dementia which I think is about as far as you can get from sounds of cars, but it's exactly the same approach that we're taking. So, just some final thoughts from an engineer's perspective. We're really interested in positive aspects of products and understanding how people respond positively and trying to emphasize them. We know if we're sort of taking it, all, not quite as a given, but the things like reliability and the negatives are reduced, but we're looking very much from an engineer perspective how to highlight the most positive things. We know that the people who actually make the decisions in the company, the engineers, usually have a quite different opinion and quite different reactions to the actual users and we need to understand that. Even though we're engineers, we're always looking for ways to try and make decisions that are not necessarily based on numbers, recognizing that they often, there's much re richer data that you can get than just looking at numbers. Some of the experiments we do, like the simulations I showed, context is often an issue, uh, not just in terms of the way that we present attributes like sound, but also, obviously, and as you well know, we need to recognize the fact that you'll get different responses from different types of people. But we've found that the sort of interactive simulation techniques we have been developing are very good at engaging people. If this, as well as providing more rigorous data, there's this pragmatic thing that suddenly the chief engineer feels more confident on making a decision when they're, for instance, comparing sound with cost and weight and styling. Interactive simulation tends to engage non-experts. It also engages the customers. So, as a conclusion, as an engineer, designer, and trying to help engineers and designers, it's crucial for us to understand the users because we know that the emotional response will affect the acceptance of the technology we're trying to de develop. So, for instance, we know that the sound of a car is going to affect how people will accept that sound, that car. We know that real-world usage is going to affect the performance, for instance, the economy of a hybrid car. 
We also, when we're looking beyond individual products, going out into public spaces, we think it's very important to understand all the different stakeholders, but we think it's vital to understand the actual users of those spaces. And all along, we're interested in how to make decisions in a different way, something that's actually going to be usable by the people who make the decisions in the companies, usually the chief engineers. And that's a particular emphasis of the work we're moving into healthcare. Uh, as Gemma said, I'd be delighted to take any questions later. Uh, but I think we'll see, even from an engineer's perspective, it's vital for us to un understand not just the preferences of people, but I think the sort of work that Gemma's doing in neuromarking isn't just telling us preferences, it's telling, them, telling us why. And that's so important in helping engineers make the decisions that are going to produce a better product or an environment.